Okay, so uh, first let me start by uh, thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, nice meeting and I profusely apologize that I should have stayed here for a longer period of time but because of some class schedule in my uh, uh, parent institute, uh, IIT Delhi, I could not manage to come here earlier and missed a lot of interesting talk which I would have otherwise loved to hear. And uh, I was in ICTS uh, on just one month back and on a completely different topic and on a condensed matter uh, work, uh, workshop at that time. And it's very nice to come to this uh, campus again within a period of a month. And uh, so this is, and uh, I, this is being a somewhat mixed uh, meeting. So I came from a very different uh, background of, uh, as far as this talk is concerned in ultra cool atoms and uh, I think in the audience uh, to the best of my knowledge except my friend uh, Tarun Ghosh from the IIT Kanpur uh, uh, possibly nobody doesn't have any much background in this particular field though people definitely know about this uh, field in general and this work is uh, an, uh, which is going to be submitted very soon and we are also going to present it in the upcoming uh, APS March meeting in uh, 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 in Colorado, and this was done with my PhD student uh, Purnima Shakko. And uh, so, with this, let me proceed here. So, uh, cold atom and condensed matter, and I work in both fields. I am primarily a condensed matter person, and also look at the cold atom problems from a condensed matter perspective. Uh, so, their measurement techniques are very interesting, and particularly this uh, talk is uh, going to veer around uh, this. Uh, issue of the gauge potentials and the dynamical uh, gauge field. So if you look at a typical Hamiltonian in the presence of an electromagnetic field, so that is what is uh, going to uh, give you your uh, momentum operator. And this is the term which uh, occurs in a two, uh, in, the, in the dynamical sense, there is also an energy term which actually makes such gauge field dynamical and that comes from the electric and the magnetic field. Now it turns out that when you try to actually realize this concept of uh, gauge potential in some way in some other system, there are some subtle uh, differences. I will very briefly uh, talk about that and uh, means before going to this actual topic that how we realize such uh, synthetic gauge field in the field of ultra cold atoms and end with some recent work with uh, Purnima. So the measurement techniques in the condensed matter, they are very different as compared to uh, the uh, ultra cold atoms. So let's say I just, you know, picked up some arbitrary slides from uh, web uh, from these two, uh, the two prominent measurements in the condensed matter system is the thermodynamic quantity, something like susceptibility, let's say as a function of temperature and a very common slide which you many of you seen that it's this uh, measurement of this uh, quantum Hall Plato's in the presence of magnetic field. In fact, I always love to show some slides on the quantum Hall effect because this is what I uh, done my thesis with and I have a connection with uh, um, this particular session chair, she was my thesis examiner, Professor Shumanti Rao. Uh, so I just wanted to show these things. So these are two very common uh, uh, means experimental techniques in the condensed matter. And when we come to the cold atoms, it is very different. Uh, though there are uh, lots of similarities which are nowadays uh, uh, emerging. So I have here pointed out, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, So this first picture which is uh, very famous and which is very well known. So this is where, uh, so there are three different uh, measurement techniques which I have uh, pointed out here. So this first picture is something which actually measure the velocity distribution of the ultra cold atoms. And this is something which is done through what is known as the absorption spectroscopy. So as one can see that, you know, at the end when one comes to the nano Kelvin temperature, the corresponding velocity distribution develops what is known as a Bose Einstein peak. For a very long period of time, this was the most dominant way of measuring the properties of the ultra cold BEC. But now, gradually, more uh, interesting uh, ways of uh, measuring the property of such ultra cold atomic systems is emerging, and they are sharing more and more similarities with the condensed matter system. And I can short of, uh, let's say, summarize these three, both all these three techniques essentially can be summarized within two words one essentially collect photons in some or other ways. So in this case, it's the absorption spectroscopy. In the second case, which is now very a, uh, a dominant way of uh, measuring the properties of this ultra cold atom is to what is known as the quantum gas microscope, where again you scatter light and collect the photons in a way 
where you can actually, so this is a more in the uh, measurement in the momentum space, whereas this is a more localized measurements in the position space, and you can actually identify a single type of ultra cold atoms, and this is very similar to what is known in the optical people as the fluorescent spectroscopy. And the third thing which is also emerging, and that is something on which the part of the talk is based around, is to make a measurement on the ultra cold atoms inside a cavity. And very recently, there is a this very important discovery of a enigmatic phase in the, which condensed matter people have actually tried to locate in the solid helium for a long period of time, the observation of the so-called super solid phase, which is simultaneously a superfluid and a crystalline solid. And that has been done by, you know, by placing the condensate inside a cross cavity and then looking at the corresponding uh, emitted, uh, this photon uh, transmitted from that particular cavity and from there locating this corresponding order parameter of such phase. So these are three, you know, dominant techniques of the uh, cold atom measurement. And as you can see that they are very different because in this particular case, this is almost like a closed quantum system. So you really cannot make a measurement of the thermodynamic properties or the, let's say, the transport properties. So you have to look for the different tools. Uh, And uh, one of the things which is also happening, as if, if I summarize, that one goes, you know, more from the global to the local probe. So the global probe, something by which I mean the probe uh, in the case of the momentum space, and the local probe is something. So this is the global probe of the same system. So this is this very famous paper where people have been able to see in an optical lattice a trans quantum phase transition from a superfluid to Mott insulator. And this is the same experimental uh, system, but now has been explored through a local probe. So these are the formation of the Mott lobe in the real space, and this has been done using this quantum gas microscopes in Harvard in uh, seven, eight years back. <coughs> but one of the very important aspect in such cold atom measurement that even though the system is in the field of lasers, there is no charge coupling for the neutral atom. As a result, you cannot really couple with a true electromagnetic field the way the electron couples with an electromagnetic field. And the measurement techniques are very different. Moreover, the electromagnetic field energy in typically in such system has been treated as an average light field with no dynamics given a classical potential. So there are some interest in you know, generating something which looks like a dynamical gauge potentials in the, uh, in the case of these ultra cold atoms. And a part of the talk will be devoted to that. So, there are a few steps of, you know, generating, so I, these are very elementary for the people who already are familiar with this particular field, but I just, because it's a very mixed audience, I just decided that I'll spend a few slides on these things before getting into the actual I mean, uh, result which I would like to present here. So artificial gauge fields and ultra cold atoms can arise from specially or temporarily modulated Hamiltonian, so the essential idea is that you take this kinetic energy term and somehow make it from the k to the k minus ea by c. That is the whole thing. So one of the first way of doing this particular thing is to do rotation on this system. So if you do this uh, rotation, then you can show that you go to this rotating frame. So you just, you know, do your corresponding transformation. And so this is going to be your uh, Hamiltonian in the, uh, sorry, uh, in the rotated frame. And uh, so this is the corresponding Schrodinger equation. So I'm here doing it in a single uh, uh, particle way to just to show the basic of this thing. So this is this ultra cold atom kinetic energy term, and this is this corresponding trap potential. And this term is coming when you are going to consider this system in the co-rotating frame. So this is going to be your transform Schrodinger equations in the co-rotating frame. And when you do this, you will end up with the following transformed Hamiltonian, and this Hamiltonian can be exactly written in the form of a charged particle in magnetic field, and the trap potential has now has changed in the following form. And this is A omega, which is looks like a vector potential that just has this following form, and you can, of course, associate a magnetic field with that. But you have to remember, in this case, this is some laser-induced potential. There is no true magnetic field, and this doesn't have any dynamical counterpart. For example, in a Typical electromagnetic system, you have this e square plus b square, which is the field energy. This doesn't exist here. The interaction between the atoms, that's being a central force type of interaction, that doesn't change under such transformation. So you do this, uh, uh, you rotate this uh, atomic cloud in this particular way, and 
you get a lot of interesting things. People have been able to do interesting experiment on these such systems. So they have observed since so this is a superfluid in the presence of a uh, in a rotated frame. So you it creates vortex like a superconductor creates a vortex in the presence of an applied magnetic field. The vortex have their own, uh, they can form the vortex lattice, those vortex lattice can vibrate. So many experiments take place. And one of the things which people would like to understand in this particular system, because since you have created an artificial magnetic field, can one lead to the situation of a quantum hall like phases? So there have been some, uh, you know, means progress in that particular direction, but quantum hall like phases was never observed till now because it requires a very strong magnetic field and a large number of vortex and it's, uh, people figured out that you know at least for the typical experimental setup it is not possible to get such large amount of magnetic field. So they are such means so the achievement is so far in mostly observing the vortex lattice and their various uh, type of associated physics with this. So a better way is this geometric phase and uh, this meeting is all about that. So this is as you know these are two uh, pictures I think which are being displayed here number of times and I also am doing the same thing. So this is Bedi Panchanatham uh, phase in this case and uh, Professor Bedi is here. And uh, and here what we do, so essentially I just, you know, provide, so I'll just very quickly go through this because I'm sure that it has been displayed a number of times. So one uh, just uh, look at such uh, time evolution of an uh, Hamiltonian which is a parameter which is uh, continuously evolving and uh, one if one does this uh, uh, one, if one does this uh, very uh, uh, this uh, simple time dependent Schrodinger equation then one can actually figure out so if uh, if there is uh, no such uh, geometric phase then uh, sorry uh, this is going to be the corresponding accumulated phase but if there is a geometric phase there will be an extra term that has to satisfy the Schrodinger equation and from there we can actually calculate the corresponding uh, Berry's phase and this phase is going to be non-trivial provided there is a periodic evolution and this corresponding parameter space contains some uh, singular points and then one can actually show that that leads to this uh, uh, Berry connections and the uh, corresponding uh, magnetic field associated with that. The one important thing is here also in this case let's say the part which really going to make such geometric phase dynamical that part is still missing. I do not have a counterpart of the terms for the E squared plus B squared in this case also. But this is more general because in the case of the rotation, one is constrained by the fact that the rotational frequency always has to be much less than the tap frequency for making this experimental system stable. In the case of the geometric phase, that particular constant is removed. So people have been do more interesting things here. Moreover, it is possible to create both abelian as well as non-abelian type of uh, gauge potential in this case. And so how do we realize this thing in the case of uh, ultra, uh, sorry. So one just considered a simple atom in the presence of a light field and this is the typical quant uh, the basic model of the quantum optics which is essentially nothing but leads to what is very famously known as the jens Cummings model. And uh, one has the kinetic energy terms which gives the internal energy levels of these atoms. And this is the terms which couples with the atomic field with the light field. And this omega is nothing but the Rayleigh frequency. So if you just solve this particular atoms at a, uh, so this uh, particular uh, Rayleigh frequency is a position dependent terms and it gives you this uh, corresponding uh, uh, eigenstates of this uh, full interacting uh, systems uh, uh, in the form of the spinors. And uh, if you now look at this, uh, this resulting states, which are the atom photon states, these are called the J states, and they have just the eigen energies, which is plus minus H bar omega. So this is just like a spin up down system. And uh, these uh, day states are uh, coordinate dependent, so they form a local basis. And now we can consider the motion of this atom in such, uh, you know, this local basis. And uh, this quantity which in terms of this, uh, this uh, local basis, that's a real number. And using this basis for this internal Hilbert space, you can actually expand your atomic state in terms of this local basis. So now you know that if something moves into such local basis adiabatically, then you can actually apply your corresponding adiabatic theorem. So you assume that the system always lies in its uh, ground state. Uh, and particularly in the case of the ultra cold atoms, this is a very easy uh, criteria which can be satisfied because the typical frequency 
uh, which gives you the energy level difference between the ground state with the excited state that is within, let's say, in an optical cavity that is of the order of the gigahertz, whereas the typical atomic transition frequency is of the order of the few hundred hertz. So it is very easy to satisfy such adiabatic conditions, particularly in the case of the ultra cold atoms. And uh, if one does that, one just do this usual algebra and one get a uh, Berry connection and the Berry phase in this case, and one can actually create the, you know, this uh, corresponding uh, uh, vector potential and uh, is uh, magnetic field in such system. So this uh, technique was uh, used, and so one, uh, if one does this required algebra, one get, you know, by operating this momentum on the psi, because now both the amplitude as well as basis, they are both coordinate dependent. So one part is going to give you the usual momentum operator and other part is going to give you the vector potential and if you look at this corresponding vector potential which is just the inner product between the gradient of the local basis with the basis itself that is nothing but a Berry connection and that gives both a vector potential as well as scalar potential. Typically what will happen that in such system the energy scale associated with the scalar potential part that is much larger than the energy scale associated with this. So essentially what it provides, it just provides something like a box potential type of problem. So the typical dynamics of this system is almost entirely controlled by this. You can do it for a two level atoms. In that case, you are going to get something like an abelian gauge field. If you do it a, with an atomic level, which are much more than that, this is something which gives what is known in the optics language as the dark state manifold that gives also a non abelian gauge field. So you get a much more variety of the gauge field as compared to the case of the rotation, but it's not a dynamical gauge field, but you can actually do. So people have did very interesting experiments on this system. I'll show some slides on that. So this is the typical form of the vector potential which is formed and the corresponding expression for the magnetic field is theta and phi, both are coordinate dependent terms. And this is also the typical form of the scalar potential which has been formed in such system. So people did this type of experiment by coupling. This experiment is done in a slightly different way. It is not exactly the way I, the theory was proposed, but uh, I'll just point out. So they just considered an ultra cold atomic system and then uh, in the, in the, uh, it's, uh, placed in the presence of the two Raman-like beams and by that they can actually shift it from one type of vector potential to the other and that is going to create a Landau gauge type of vector potential. Okay, so, you, so this is going to be a typical Hamiltonian which is very uh, similar to, uh, you know, this uh, type of Hamiltonian which I have shown. So this particular Abbey frequency gives the coupling between the internal states and when you just diagonalize this particular Hamiltonian you get these corresponding dress states and uh, this in this particular dress state basis it essentially gives you a charged particle in a magnetic field. They did this corresponding experiment and since again you have a superfluid in the presence of a magnetic field so you get the creation of the vortices like this and also some vortex lattice. Now you are no more con is constrained that your corresponding gauge field has to be less than the corresponding tapping potential. But you can do many more things and using, as I have just pointed out, that using, you know, more varied type of experimental setup, they have been able to also create non-abelian type of gauge field, spin orbit coupling and all other things in such system. So this is effectively your corresponding Hamiltonian in presence of such gauge field. Of course, in an ultra cold atomic system, you have an interaction term because that's a many body system. I'm only going to show here the kinetic energy part and you can actually study various properties of such system. So there is now I summarize that what is the major difference between a typical superconducting system and what is the corresponding case of the ultra cold atomic superfluid. So in the ultra cold atomic superfluid in this type of gauge field whether you use it by the rotation or you use it by this uh, light atom coupling you know means under various situations like the cases which I have just shown. If you look at your typical Hamiltonian, then this is going to be your energy functional. This is what is famously known as the gross pitavisky energy functional. So this gives you the nonlinear interaction in the system and this is going to give, 
giving you the kinetic energy term and of course there will be some trapping potential which I have not mentioned here. If you look, compare it with this counterpart for the charged superfluid which is nothing but a superconductor, you get something very similar. So you again have a nonlinear interaction, you have a kinetic energy term but you also have a part which actually makes this gauge field dynamic. And because it's a dynamic, it can show something like Meissner-like effect because by the dynamic we mean that the atomic dynamics is also going to influence the gauge field and vice versa. That leads to a lot of interesting phenomena. So those phenomena you cannot actually observe in this case. There is also another interesting aspect here that in the ultra cold atomic system, what truly matters is the gauge potential and not the gauge field because you actually engineer the light up atom interaction in some way to just write your kinetic energy piece in the following way, right? So therefore, the let's say I have just shown two cases. In the case of the rotation, this particular term looks like a symmetric gauge potential. In the case of this uh, Raman coupler, it looks like a Landau gauge type of potentials. And you can actually see very different phenomena as your gauge potential is going to change, which doesn't happen in a truly gauge invariant system. Because in the truly gauge invariant system, as long as your magnetic field is going to be same, you are going to observe the same things. But here, actually, it is the atom light interaction which can be written in this form. So as a result, there are experimental ways to actually see the difference between the structure which is coming out of the Landau gauge type of vector potentials or the symmetric gauge type of vector potentials. So not all measurable quantities are going to be gauge invariant because in that sense, it is not truly and you know, means this uh, dynamical uh, gauge system. So that's a very important difference in the ultra cold atomic system when you talk about the synthetic gauge field that need to be understood when we compare these systems with the typical charged condensed matter system. So now I come uh, to this part of this talk which is the uh, what we actually pointed out whereas most of the focus is to create something which looks like an uniform magnetic field because what I have actually shown you that in the ultra cold atomic system you can do local measurements. So like for example in the condensed matter if you have a quantum Hall states, I do not have a way in any condensed matter experimental technique how one is actually going to look at the electronic arrangement in such quantum Hall state. One can measure the transport properties, one can measure the thermodynamic properties and from there about the nature of the electron correlation or the arrangement of the electrons one can infer. In ultra cold atoms you can actually do a local measurement. So we actually can show how these particular atoms are arranged. And this is one of the reasons that is why this particular system what is known as a quantum simulator where you can actually try to study many such analogs of such condensed matter phases in the ultra cold atomic system. So most of the focus are on the uniform magnetic field but there are also very interesting phenomena which occurs when one consider a non-uniform magnetic field and here we have just provided that one such very interesting phenomena which is called snake states. Uh, in electron where electron actually you know means in a varied magnetic field they can follow a snake like trajectory that can be created in such ultra cold atomic system. For that we have chosen a typical cavity configuration. So this is another way of you know doing the experiments on the ultra cold atomic system where the atoms is placed inside a cavity. Here of course I am going to give you a single atom version of that. So this type of cavity is something which is known as a ring cavity because in a typical cavity what will happen because of the reflection of the mirrors it follows some standing wave type of modes. But in the ring cavity, you can actually get a running mode apart from the standing wave types of modes. So here you present the atom is located here and the, you just you know put a transverse pump to light up these atoms with some particular beam. And then this light, after getting scattered from the atoms, they populate the mode of these two cavities. So now in this case, the light field actually get dynamical because when this light populates the mode of the cavity, they form some wave pattern. In some case, some standing wave patterns in this case. And those standing wave patterns of the light is now going to localize these atoms. And as a result, the scattering properties of the atoms are going to change. So there is a feedback from the atomic system to the light system. So if you would like to understand the nature of the synthetic gauge field in such system, you have to simultaneously solve the equation for the matter field as well as the light field. They are both coupled and they are in a purely quantum optics design. The Hamiltonian is again is very simple. It's a Jens Cummings type of model, but now in presence of two such cavity modes. So this part is the atomic Hamiltonian. 
uh, written in the Swinger uh, uh, representation. This part is just the cavity modes. And this part is the atom pump coupling, which is typical in the dipolar form for the typical field strength and the atom cavity coupling. So this is a very standard thing in the quantum optics which people do. And one can write this thing. Then one do a set of uh, approximations, do rotating wave approximations, which is nothing but throwing out the high frequency terms and then do the adiabatic elimination of the excited states. And then one finally come to these dress states. So there is some typos here. So I have originally the atom photon states. So when you ignore the atom photon interaction, there are these three states. So this is the ground state with photon numbers in the two cavities, which are given by N1 and N2. And there is an excited state, which will absorb one such photon and go to the excited state. So that can be written as E N1 N2 minus 1. There is a little bit typo here. This is E, N1, minus 1, and N2. So I have these three states, and all of them are having the same energy. Or oh, five minutes. OK, I will be able to finish this. OK. So you write your full atom photon Hamiltonian, go to the interaction picture, and you calculate these corresponding gas states. The atom pump detuning gets modified in the presence of the atom field coupling. And this modification is directly proportional to cavity mode functions and the number of photons in these two cavity modes. So you can automatically see that, you know, the gauge field which will arise out of that, that is actually going to depend on this atom pump detuning. And that is actually proportional to the number of photons in the two cavity modes. So this is the way the gauge field in this case, in some sense, becomes a dynamical. And if there is no atom photon coupling, then the dress stage just comes back to the degenerate Baird states. So I now do the same trick, which I have just shown. This tutorial, if you would like to know about more tutorial, there's a very nice review article by Gene Dalibert and uh, his that time postdoc uh, uh, Garbier. This is in the RMP as a colloquium, so you can just have a look at that. So you can just write your atomic state, expand it in the basis of this day state. Again, you get all the geometric phase and all other things in this system. And typically, the velocity of the atom is very small. This is what I just pointed out, that a typical transition frequency of the atomic system is the order of 100 hertz, whereas the frequency of the dress stress energy is of the order of the gigahertz. So there is a huge separation. So your adiabatic criteria is completely satisfied in this case. You don't have to, means you can do experiments where the adiabatic criteria is very well satisfied. And uh, if we go further, I can just write down my corresponding in this setup, I can write, just write my canonical momentum, which gives me this following Berry connection for this case. So, and if I just explicitly write this form, this is what is going to be my following vector potentials, which is nothing but the Berry connection in this case, and this is going to be the corresponding magnetic field. So there is a, again a typo here, it will be g0 squared and there will be a factor of 2 here. So I have forgot means to correct, means correct this thing. So, and this b0 has the dimension mt inverse. So if you remember with the usual magnetic field in the case of the charge particle, there is a, another dimension for the charge which is absent there. So this is the magnetic field for the case of neutral charge neutral atoms. It defines the unit and the dimension of the synthetic magnetic field. And you can also assign a magnetic length with such system. And you plot it. So you get something very interesting. So this is the form of your corresponding Berry connection or the vector potential. And this is the form of your magnetic field. So this is not an uniform magnetic field. So a part of this is an up and this part is down. So you have the magnetic field, it changes sign. And if the magnetic field changes sign, it actually does something very interesting, which you can very easily understand. So this was a problem which was actually solved in even Jackson's electrodynamics book, but and it gains prominence in the condensed matter system much later. So you can immediately see that, you know, if this particular region where the magnetic field changes sign around this particular point, the electron will not be allowed to completely cyclotron orbit. So if it goes halfway along one direction in the cyclotron orbit, in the other half, it is just going to change this direction. And this is something which is known as snake state. In fact, Torun is sitting there. He did some interesting work when he was a postdoc, I remember, on the snake state with uh, Reinhard Egger, right? OK. So this is uh, something which is going to give the snake states. And snake states are very interesting object for the condensed matter people they, because they can give some very 
lead to some very interesting devices also in a certain sense. And we did some work and that is what actually brought us to the, you know, this, uh, about the information about this next state few, uh, couple of years back with uh, my former PhD student Pooja Mandel. And uh, we did it in, uh, with an experimentalist in UK, Alan Nogaret in University of Bath. And he has some very interesting results on such, uh, in presence of such magnetic field. And we theoretically explained these uh, results with the three of us. And uh, so this is going to be, so these are, as you know, these are something which is known as the skipping orbit. This forms the usual quantum all eight states. But in between, if your magnetic field changes sign, it also gives something which is known as the magnetic states because this next state can be now thought about something which also gives an one dimensional motion, but purely due to the variation of this magnetic field. And this is what is known as the magnetic states. People have observed magnetic states both in the case of the 2D electron gas and as well as for in the case of the graphene also. So this is a uh, reference to an uh, experimental paper where they have actually observed such uh, uh, these snakes orbits in the case of the graphene. In the graphene it's a little bit different because in the graphene one can actually just change the potential and create a P and N type. So what is an up magnetic field on the P side that will be a down magnetic field on the N side and that can actually lead to the this formation of such snake states. So now we are going to have the cold atom counterpart of such snake states in this system. So if one just work out the semi-classical motion of the atoms now in such cavity in this, in, in this particular direction, one can immediately see that it is going to form this thing. So this is what is the snake state trajectory. And you can immediately see that, you know, why it's called a snake state, why it is this name. And if one does the full quantum mechanics, so this is this famous uh, diagram from the Halperin's 1982 paper, where he first introduced this concept of uh, quantum Hall H states. So now these are, these are quantum Hall states, A states are associated classically with what is known as the skipping orbits. Now in the presence of such magnetic field, what will happen apart from this end A states, one is also going to have, because now you do not have an uniform magnetic field. So the degeneracy of the Landau level is lifted and it is going to form a parabolic pattern with in some point the degeneracy is going to be you know, lifted by the change of the strength of such uh, uh, this magnetic field. So it is going to give you again a parabolic spectrum like a free particle which corresponds to this type of classical motion. So that's what, let me summarize. So I am at the end of my talk. So cavity can be used to create novel type of synthetic gauge field for ultra cold atoms. Because of their dependence on the cavity photon numbers, this gauge field can be made dynamical. And it is also possible to simulate atomic analog of electronics next states that what we have demonstrated in this work. Thank you for your kind attention. We have time for